Hello everyone. Today is Thursday, March 6, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week is the week where I really mean it. We got a ton of stuff to cover, so I'm gonna get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Still searching for a uh, sponsorship for the show. Someone with a uh, caffeinated drink. Maybe Monster. It's been a long time since we shorted Monster. So um, maybe that'll be okay. Oh, good stuff. Sitting here enjoying a piece of candy, courtesy of Cinti Trading. Much thanks for that. And the thumb drive of 2012 weekend charts. I was not expected that. Thank you, Mr. Landry. Mr. Landry is my father's name. But you're welcome, Jeff. Yeah, if it fits, it shifts. If if, if it fits, it ships. We're not going to get into these slips this early in, uh, in the presentation. Yeah, I toss in a little candy in that um, in that flat rate box. There's the disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I think Yogi Berra said that uh, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Hey, this is part of the show where I uh, I beg for a review. If you read the book, you like the book. I don't know why else you'd be here, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, throw me a bone, put me a review on Amazon.com. Um, the overwhelming number of reviews up there are uh, very positive, but there are a couple stinkers out there, so it does help to balance things out. Even if you agree with everyone else, I appreciate it. All right, what else is going on? Well, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. You know, I don't want to spend too much time about that. I'd rather just talk about it. Uh, I got an interesting email this week, and it, 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 everything really played out in a pretty cool fashion, so I, I'm very anxious to kind of talk about it. So what being a good little technician is all about, and also what makes technical analysis great and there are some cool things, and I think we need to stop and remind ourselves every now and then the the merits of technical analysis and how good it can be. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about bigger picture versus shorter term patterns. We've got a big picture pattern that looks fantastic. Shorter term, eh, not so much, but we'll talk about that in one second. I've uh, got a couple of smoke them if you got them for this week. And uh, one is who cares what they do, and one of them is going to be under the dead money report. And there's a bunch of other stuff I want to talk about, too. All right, let's talk about long-term versus short-term. Uh, I was on the radio last week or week before, I forget exactly when, and as we were going to, or as they were going to break, I thought the segment was over, and he quickly said, hey, uh, give me a stock that will go up 50 points. I'm like, I have A and V. And the reason I said that, I only – because we had position in there. Uh, but it had made this big old base in here for about, oh, I don't know, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven months. And then it had made its first bow tie in years. And also, this was a pretty high price stock. It was up in its 40s in 2013 and even beyond. So I have a, a, a feeling this stock has the potential, especially when you see these stocks come down in base for a long, long time. They uh, reinvent themselves, they clear up the balance sheets, they do whatever they have to do, and then they begin to take off again. I call them a phoenix stock. A friend of mine, Dick Fruth, calls them tombstones, and usually you'll get like a bow tie or something coming out of this base. And these bow ties off these all-time lows, especially when they make a long, long, long base, and especially when they've been in a downtrend forever like this, okay, and then they go sideways, these would be very powerful signals. Now, let's take a look at this shorter term now. Now, we did, as you know, we did play this. We got a trigger in here. Let's see, probably was about right there. Ran out. We got a partial profit. It came back in and stopped us out. Now, of course, it's going to decide to go back up. But the reason I didn't like it as a new setup in and of itself, even though it looked great longer term, it pulled all the way back in to this prior little base in here. But so far, it's actually working out. But for me to get interested in it again, it's going to have to set up. Again, maybe make some new highs and uh, have a little bit of a pullback. But, yeah, it is a bummer that it is continuing to work out in here. But I'm getting quite a few emails like this saying, Dave, should we just jump back in? Because it sure looks like it has longer-term potential. And I agree that it has longer-term potential, but I think you're better off 
waiting for the short term setup. In general, in this particular case, um, I might be proven wrong, both uh, shorter term and longer term on that. Well, it might be proven wrong, shorter term, the bigger picture pattern wins. But in general, you want to trade off the short term pattern because the market, you can only predict the short term when it comes to markets, but you can certainly look at the bigger picture, longer term pattern, and see what the potential is, and then get your timing right on the short term chart, which I thought we had here because it looked pretty good. It made this strong run up, TKO move. We got triggered. Nice little up move here. And unfortunately, we got stopped out on the remainder of the position. But ideally, you want everything to work short term. And again, you can only predict the short term, but make sure your bigger picture pattern is in place. So it doesn't mean that we're gone forever on this stock. It's um, closing in, I guess, on six bucks a share. So instead of riding it from five fifty, five dollars and fifty cents, maybe we get in a point higher. If it does still have a fifty point run, then uh, so what if we miss the first point or two? So don't be too anxious to jump in if the big picture looks pretty good. Make sure you got that shorter term setup. This is an interesting email I got this day, uh, this day, a couple days ago. I didn't think I would see the day when you selected a newspaper company to trade or trend. And this is my reply. I know. I had to close my eyes and do it like a good little technician. Newspapers are going away, but there's a reason people are buying them up. I think they're looking for eyeballs. Cheers, Dave. Now, the reason I said looking for eyeballs, I think this is someone who's normally in the show. Why are they calling me? I guess the sound is working. Um, and that's just my reasoning. You don't have to worry about the reasoning. There's obviously a reason some people are buying newspapers, and newspapers are going higher. I just don't know the reason. All I'm saying is maybe they're looking for eyeballs. Maybe they're looking at these Internet companies, these little app companies or whatever, got bought out for $4 billion and saying, wait a minute, there are more people, or as many people, I should say, reading a newspaper as there are with this little app. Why not? Let's just buy out the newspaper and we get those eyeballs. I don't know why newspapers are going higher. They just are. And it's a horrible business, but they just are. Okay? Okay, we'll get back to that with Jonathan. So let's take a look at the setup. Now, if you go back, i have often say, but at the end of this presentation, I'll probably talk a little bit about my books, but the, the first book is still relevant. And if you look in the first book, I kind of snuck it in there. There's a pattern, there's an IPO type of pattern that I kind of snuck into the first book. And this is, you can see, you get these deep retracements sometimes in these IPOs. They go straight up, you get a deep retracement, you look to play that retracement. So we had a setup in this one. I gave it a pretty liberal entry. And the initial profit target was 15. So this is a smoke of if you got them. Um, it's come back off. It's down in here somewhere a little bit today. But you can see it shot up in here. We got the initial profit target. It came back a little bit. Now, this says biotechnology. That's not correct because I looked it up to see what it was. And it is some sort of newspaper, periodical type of publisher. Now, why would I buy a newspaper? I don't know. It's a horrible business. They're going out of business. They're going bankrupt, newspapers, that is. But for some reason, newspaper companies are going up, and for some reason, people are buying newspapers. So it's not my job to tell you why. And I'll say, I said earlier, maybe they're looking for eyeballs. But that's just me speculating, and I'm not going to speculate on the whys. What is is, okay, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is is okay now let's talk about being a good little technician okay and a corollary the great thing about technical analysis okay ta finds clues for you often in places you never look i can't tell you how many times like a friend of mine used to say he says okay you can tell me <laughs> i can't tell you how many times I've passed over newsletters because they're low news newspapers because they're low in HV and they're just not trending and they just don't seem like a stock that we 
as these uh, traders who go for these inefficient uh, little gold stocks and biotechnology stocks and hot technology stocks and semiconductor stocks and solar panel stocks. Why would we trade a newspaper? Well, it's what the market is offering, and it also looked pretty good. It had a pretty sharp trend, nice little pullback, and other newspapers were doing well. So sometimes technical analysis will give you some sort of clue to an area in a place that you would never look. I always tend to kind of pay attention to the biotechs and, and the semiconductors and all these other areas. And I don't really go out and look at newspapers per se, but if they come up in my scans, maybe the database is trying to tell me something. So sometimes technical analysis will point you to a place that you never would have thought of. The collective mind or the smart money will leave footprints. So if somebody's on to something or the so-called smart money starts buying up an area, they're going to leave footprints and others will join in. And this is where us as technical traders, as technicians, can come in and capitalize on that. We don't have to figure out, again, like we'll talk about this in one second too, but, but the pressure's off. We don't have to come in and figure out every angle in the world and some sort of theme. And it seems like years ago, you get these cold calls from brokers, and they would just come up with some sort of theme and be like, there was a lot of rain in the Midwest. It washed away all the fertilizer. So we were recommending fertilizer companies because the companies will, the farms will have to refertilize. You know, whether or not that worked or not, I don't know. But they're throwing this logic out there that makes some sort of sense. So you think you should rush out and buy some fertilizer stocks, whatever the case may be. And the logic may even be flawed. But instead of trying to figure that out on your own and trying to come up with these ideas, let the market tell you what to do. Let the database tell you what to do. Why are newspapers going up? I don't know, but they are. And the market, the database served one up to us a couple days ago, so we took it. Okay. So the collective mind will leave those footprints, or if you prefer to call it a smart money, when one area begins to heat up, then it's going to go off on our screens, no matter what the area is, solar or uranium or newspapers or yoga clothes or burritos or exercise clothes for guys like me who eat too many burritos. It's going to pop up on our radar. A couple of years ago, uh, my wife's uncle calls me up and says, hey, Dave, I think these lithium batteries are going to be the greatest thing in Greytown. So that was just his opinion. And he had heard that Warren Buffett or someone was buying up lithium battery company stocks. So I made a list of these battery company stocks. And almost all of them went straight down. And I was looking at the list the other day. It looks like some of them went bankrupt. It's not to say that lithium battery companies are bad, or the batteries are bad, <laughs> or the batteries are dead. But just because you have a feeling about something or someone says something doesn't make it true. What makes it true is when the charts say it's true and when the charts begin to rally and these stocks begin to set up. And that's the great thing about technical analysis. It's going to find the areas for you. Over the years, I've invested, or I should say traded, however you want to look at it, in a lot of areas, areas I never would have thought of. A few years ago, I never bought a home building stock because they're just kind of there. They don't move around much or do a whole lot. But then guess what? We had a housing bubble or boom or whatever. And those stocks traded like momentum stocks. It was freaking crazy. So if you could have an open mind and be flexible and let the database tell you what to do, you'd be surprised where that database will 
lead you. I channeled the great Johnny Cochran and said, hey, if the pattern is a fitting, you must not be a quitting. Okay? So if you see a stock and you got a really good setup, you got an acceleration of momentum, you got a nice pullback, you don't have any overhead supply, other stocks in the sector are looking pretty good. Uh, other, the sector overall looks pretty good. The market's not looking too bad. So regardless of what that sector is, if everything fits, if the pieces are a fitting, if the pattern is a fitting, then you must not be a quitting. So all those things we talked about back in December in the stock selection webinar, acceleration, persistency, the overhead supply, and a lot of those things I touched upon in the, um, in the free videos up on my website. So if all those things are working, then go for it, okay? Um, hey, Lulu, don't confuse the issue with facts. www. Don't, no apostrophe, confuse the issue with facts.com. Um, I remember a while back, I think it was a few years back on the service, and Lulu came up in my scans. Lulu, never heard of them. So I did a quick little Google, and it said they make yoga clothes. And that, that kind of reminded me of the Seinfeld, where they were going to broadcast opera, televised opera through the radio or something, whatever the harebrained scheme Kramer had come up with at the time. But it would just seem silly. Yoga clothes, really? Are you serious? And I laughed at that. And the setup was a really good-looking setup. It was beautiful. Nice little pullback, accelerate trend. I don't remember exactly when it is. I'm sure somebody's going to ask. I was looking back at the chart, and several times it, it had set up. I think we played it once or twice since that one time. But I remember watching it in anguish over the next few days to a point where I think I had to take it off of my screen. It went up about 40% over the next week or so. And I was uh, I made fun of the stock because of who they are or what they are or because of the funny sounding name. Well, that was a that was a pretty good lesson for me. Now, pretty late in my career too, so you never stop learning. And as a technician, you just have to I hate to say go with the flow, but for lack of a better phrase, I think that's uh, very much what you do in many cases. So don't confuse the issue. With facts. Now, one thing you got to watch for, and someone was just um, emailing me about this. They were asking, I think they were asking about solar stocks, but solar is within the SIBIs. Sometimes you can have a specialized subsector, okay? I think a current example of that would probably be uranium. Metals and mining overall is kind of getting a little choppy and all in here, but uranium is going straight up for the most part. So sometimes you got to figure out that a stock doesn't necessarily belong in the sector it's in, or even if it does, it, it really trades more like some other sort of stock. So, for instance, solo stocks, I think, are, are put underneath uh, semiconductor stocks or electronics, and yeah, they're electronics, but they're really not a semi. They're more like, I mean, they, the semis in them, I mean, they are electronics. But they're more like a maybe an alternate energy or a solar stock. So look at other solar stocks when you're looking at that. Uranium, look at other uranium stocks and not necessarily metals and mining overall. Uh, an example that comes to mind quite often, I don't think the company exists anymore. I think it was CCMP uh, in the chemicals. And... Let's say you got a specialized company, and I think CCMP made a chemical that was used by the semiconductor manufacturers to wash off the semiconductor boards. And I don't think the chemical was used for anything else. So 99, maybe 100% of their business was the semiconductor industry. So it's kind of like a, I guess like, a, was it picks and axe or picks? What's this? Uh, what do you go? Picks and shovels for the gold miners? Uh, so it's picks and uh, shovels for the semiconductors. So it really traded more like a semiconductor stock and not like a chemical. 
and the chemicals weren't doing too well at the time, a couple of times that we um, had this stock on, on the trading service. So uh, keep an eye out for some sort of specialized sector where technical analysis might be telling you something. So let's say you got a setup, you really like it, and the sector's not looking so hot. Well, dig a little deeper and see whether or not um, it could be in a specialized sector. Does a trend following mean go with the flow? Yes, it does. Did I say don't go with the flow? I said something about go with the flow earlier, okay? Maybe you don't go anywhere the wind blows, but if you like if you like a good setup, then take it, okay? Now, before we get into the dead money report, got a question here. Dave, the risk of being a money water quarterback on A&V, I see a bunch of lows in the 450 area. Retrospect, why do you play stop below those? Okay. The problem that happened, and this sometimes will happen with the money management, the way the money management works. Let me draw it on here first, and then we'll look at the chart. The money management says, if you get in the entry and the stock, in fact, let's go to, let's go to the screen here. The money management says that, once you get to the initial profit target off the table, you bring that stop up to break even, okay? So the question is, why did you bring the stop to break even? Well, because that's what the money management dictates. Now, sometimes when you have a major trend developing, you'll get knocked out of that move, okay? For instance, you can see, Entry was here, so that means the stop is here once you get to the initial profit target. So sometimes it will come back, do that one little last kiss goodbye, and then it's off to the races. Nothing's perfect, okay? Uh, and that's why it's okay to apply a little bit of discretion, especially if it's just a stop, Nick, okay? Let's say your stop is, um, let's redraw this. Let's say the market rallies up. There's your entry here, and that becomes your stop because your stop goes from down here to up here, and it comes down. You've already taken partial profits. So even if it dips a little bit below this stop, STOP, you are still profitable. If it begins, provided it begins to turn back around, then it's okay to stick stay with the position. It's okay to apply a little bit of discretion. You can't let it keep on dropping, though, and let an overall profitable position turn into a loss. Yes, that's one thing that could be frustrating with markets is they come down, stop you out, out, and then it's off to the races. It happens, okay? And usually, if I'm in a webinar or well, usually a seminar, I can't see your hands, but in a seminar, I'll say anybody else, anybody in here, anybody else is true. Anybody in here gets stopped out to the penny and then watches ang in anguish as the market takes off without you. And then anybody in the room has been trading for more than a day raises their hands. Like, yeah, okay, it happens, and it will happen to you sooner or later. But every now and then you get lucky enough to where you can apply a little bit of discretion. So here's the point was that, well, you got some support in here. You know, why would you exit a support? Well, because the stop got hit following the um, money management and position management, okay? Susan says, my battery company went bankrupt. Learn to use stops on that one. Yeah, I mean, that's a problem too, okay? The better the story sounds, the more suspect you need to be. <laughs> it's almost uh, counterintuitive. It's like... Uh, well, Warren Buffett's buying batteries. Well, Warren Buffett is buying batteries. Well, geez, I better run out and buy some too. But when you look at the stocks, they all were headed lower at the time, and I think a lot of them did go bankrupt, including, um, I guess, the one that Susan was in. Okay. I got an A&V on the 21st, used the discretion it held on. I guess this was a bad entry. Oh, I don't know. I think you did okay, John. But so far, it's coming back. Yeah, it's fine. I don't know where the entry was on the 21st. Just, you know, do you have a setup on the 21st? If you, as long as you had a setup, then by all means, take it. All right. Uh, dead money report. 
And I said I didn't have a sponsor, but I have a sponsor for the Dead Money Report. It's brought to you by www.trendfollowingmoron.com. Okay. Now, in case you're wondering, if you're new to these presentations, if you're wondering what the Dead Money Report is, a lot of times we'll get to a stock. It'll look fantastic going in. Remember, you want to obsess before going into a position, not afterwards. But it seems like as soon as we trigger, it kind of dies out, goes flat for a while, doesn't get stopped out. Just yesterday, or day before, I forget, maybe day before, I was coming back from Florida with a friend, and um, he asked me, how long will you stick with a position if your stop isn't hit? And, I, and my answer was forever. Let the market take you out of the position. Okay, and that's why I'm not worried about dead money. Dead money means it's money. So-called dead money is not making any money for you, and it never will. Well, it's the end. It never will. I don't believe in. Okay, if you knew that it never would, and you don't, then you would exit. But you don't know that. Okay. So almost every week, or quite often, I should say, we have a dead money report. And this was uh, TAN. Triggers here. We got to stop here. It triggers and it dies. Okay, but it didn't stop us out. So there's no reason to exit. Yeah, it's pretty ugly looking at that point, but it still has a longer term trend that may be in place. Who knows? Okay, and you want that perfection going in. This thing looked like it was reversion to the mean move and just sort of do that. But what happened? It did this. Well, you could have said after a couple of days, a couple of weeks, you just said, well, the hell with it. I'm just going to get out. Well, all you got to do is just honor your stop. And the question always comes up, well, well Dave, why can't I just get back in? Well, it might not set up again for you to get back in. And then you might come in. This is the ETF, so it's less likely to happen. But you might come in, and that stock gets opened 10, 20 points overnight in your favor, and you exited because someone told you, oh, you could just always get back in. Well, that sounds great in theory, but as you probably know, theory and practice are not the same. In theory, they are, but in practice, they are not. There's some famous quote about that. So it kind of died out, but then it began to take off again. It sort of died out a little bit, and then, bam, off to the races, okay? Now, I think in round numbers, this is about a 20% gain. It did take a few months. I think it took about four months. So, but if you could get 20% in four months, that's 60% a year. And that's better than a poke in the eye. Now, if you're looking at it, this is just from uh, somebody pointed out, I think it was Phil last week, that, well, it's 60% it's, uh, annualized on the price move. But on your portfolio, what would the move be? Well, it would be, let's see, like a 4% move your entire portfolio. Well, that's nothing to sneeze at because if you got a dozen of these stocks, if you trade a dozen stocks or 20 stocks over the year, make it 4%, then that's like an 80% move in your overall portfolio. Or maybe even, I was doing the math earlier this morning, could be as much as a 200% move in your overall portfolio. But I don't want to get into the money management when I'm showing the, the actual moves. And the actual move in this particular case was a 20% gain and then I don't want to jinx anything, but I'm going to say and counting. And now we're up here at 50 bucks and 31 cents. As a, oh, 50 bucks and 21 cents. Maybe I did jinx things, okay? Um, so, so far, so good. And then it's the and counting where the real money could come in, okay? So, oh, Phil agrees with me this week. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I just want to show things on a I want to show things on a percentage basis when I talk about something like dead money, because if you make a 20% move, okay, and here's your gain here, it's eight and a half uh, points, round numbers, 20% move, round numbers. So that was, it took uh, one third, no, one fourth of the year to do that, like a quarter, I think. So if you could do that four times a year, three times a year, I think it was uh, four months to do it, then four times, I'm getting tripped up in here. Three times 20 would be 60%. But you get the idea. Even though it's so-called dead money, it still worked well. Now, it doesn't always work out. 
But you've got to realize this is just a very small part of your entire portfolio, and maybe something else is working out, too. And a lot of people obsess over dead money, and it's just the microwave society we live in. You will have some positions that will not always work for you. Hey, guess what? You will get stopped out of some positions. And don't don't cry to me when you get into position and it goes three weeks sideways and then stops you. Oh, well, I should have just got out one week in. Well, that's fine. But if you exit at every little sign of adversity, of adversity, you'll never hit a home run. You'll never have the big winner. Now, uh, I put the portfolio again this week. Getting, I get a lot of questions on it. And people are like, um, what are you actually in? This is the actual portfolio that I make public, okay? And um, it is hypothetical. I've got to say this, okay, for all, uh, just to avoid any type of trouble. Some of these are, let's just put it this way, some of these are real fills. And if they're not a real fill, they're time and sales. So these are realistic numbers in here, and these were recommended far ahead of time. Some of these positions went days without triggering. So uh, there's no hindsight in here. It's not um, hypothetical in hindsight. It's hypothetical in the tracking of the recommendations, okay? Um, now, with that disclaimer aside, this week we had, last week I think it was ENG, a little gold company that uh, hit the profit target for us. And this week it was TAN and that little newspaper we talked about earlier hit the initial profit target. Okay. Now we're looking for about a one percent move. You can see right around a thousand bucks on the first loaf, and the real money comes in on the second loaf. And right now we've got this is not a bad winner here. And then as you can see with this um, NG, and let me get a current quote for you on that four thirty two. So this number is a little bit bigger here. So this is not a bad. Uh, not a bad trade so far. Uh, last week we talked about this portfolio being fairly evenly distributed, and usually that's not what normally happens. Usually you have one or two big winners. And now we're beginning to get a standout or two uh, in the RLYP and especially in the NG. Uh, black and white, the reason I'm showing this is that it's kind of cool. Eight out of eight positions are profitable, and seven out of eight have hit the initial profit target. So anything that's highlighted is still long or short, whatever the case may be. So this is, and anything that is not highlighted, uh, partial profits have been taken on that position. So in a case like TAN, you would do 250 shares based on uh, 100K, again, hypothetical portfolio, 2% risk if stopped out, divide that into two positions. So it would be 125 shares and 125 shares. This is going to be your trading, what I call loaf, and this is going to be your trending loaf. Down here was 4,000 shares based on the stop placement. This is your trading loaf, and this is your trending loaf, okay? This trading loaf helps to keep the lights on, helps to let you make a little money if the position doesn't work out. But additionally, works moves in your favor. Um, might help to keep you in business. Sometimes in choppy markets, you get lucky and you're able to somehow make money in spite of the overall market. But in general, you're not going to get rich off of this. You're not going to get rich off of any trading system that has a fixed return. I don't want to get into these debates with anyone. But if you're in any type of trading system that has a maximum return, okay, I don't think you're going to make a lot of money, at least in the long run, because even if you have a very, very tight, tight, tight risk, okay, there's still a chance that something bad can happen to you longer term. Oh, but Dave, I day trade, and uh, that'll never happen to me. Because it don't hold overnight. Oh, really? Well, what, what's going to happen if uh, they discover their drug or whatever is killing people and they halt the stock in the middle of the day and then the next trade is 20 points lower, okay? Well, Dave, well, that could help happen to you too. Well, if I'm position trading and I'm up 20 points, then I just scratch out or I'm, maybe I'll make 20 points on another trade or 40 points or 50 points. 
because I have the potential to have unlimited gains and I have somewhat limited losses. I say somewhat limited losses because something bad could always happen. But at least I position myself for the potential unlimited gains. I'm also scaling out of the position, so I'm reducing my share size, reducing my risk, okay? And I keep saying, me, 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 me. Well, you could do it too. You can trade a system, and it doesn't have to be my system, but whatever system you decide upon and whatever methodology you decide upon, just make sure you have the potential for somewhat limited losses. I have to use the word somewhat in there because sooner or later you will get whacked. One of the few things I can guarantee. And potential unlimited gains, okay? And that's where the real money is in those potential unlimited gains. Okay, can you remind me how to calculate the amount of shares you buy per position? Well, if you want, I'll give you the spreadsheet, and um, you could just punch it in. Uh, you just, it's, I don't want to bore everybody too much. Let me just do it as quickly as possible. Let's say you risk it 2% per trade if stopped out. So in this particular trade, we had a three-point stop. Well, that makes the math a little hard, um, but it would be... 2% per trade, let's say we got a 100K account, so it's 2,000 per trade, okay? You divide that by three points, and that should give you the amount of shares to trade. 2,000 divided by three equals 666 shares. And then you divide that into two loaves, a trading loaf and a trending loaf. Math's pretty easy on this one, okay? because it was a one point stop, S-T-O-P. So 2,000 divided by one equals 2,000. And then for tracking purposes, we put it as a trading loaf and a trending loaf in the spreadsheet. Dave, why do you separate them? Well, because it makes it easier for me to see them as two different things, even though you buy all 2,000 shares in the case of LIOX at once. But if I'm looking at it as a one to trade and one to keep, one to, it's kind of like a, one that like a candy bar out there. It's like one for you and one for your friends or whatever. So if you, if you have them physically separated like that, then when it comes time to dump, some shares for profit, it makes it a little easier. And you don't feel that ego saying, well, let me just hold on for top dollar here because whatever. You just think, well, maybe it's going to go even higher as opposed to just exiting those half of those shares. Okay, Email me privately if you need me to discuss that further uh, as far as amount. Okay. How did this do in 2008? It made money in 2008. It did not print money, but it made money um, because we shorted the whole year. And um, we didn't set the world on fire because there was some sharp retraces and all. I think the mechanical portfolio, and don't quote me on this, it's hypothetical anyway, so it doesn't matter, does it? But I think the mechanical portfolio made like 12% or something like that. Okay. Do you manually enter stock, do you manually enter stock prices for your your tables or input some kind of data feed so it's updated real time. Um, I do, I used to have a real time feed hooked in and then I no longer had it and then um, recently I installed some software and it looks like it's trying to update the prices but uh, I actually manually enter everything in this thing now. Hey, you get a little, if you watch it in real time, it could kind of, you end up kind of uh, chasing your own tail a little bit. How do you choose a stop that is wide enough? Well, it depends. Okay, what are the criteria? It depends. Um, as I say quite often, it, it's I was talking to a client a while back. He says your your eyeball because I'm always saying eyeball. It's like well, he said your your eyeball in it is is really amazing the way you can eyeball these stocks. Well, I think it's a learned behavior, but it's a lot of common sense. If a stock is bouncing around two and three points a day, then you need to have your stop STOP well outside of that normal volatility. So you eyeball the normal volatility, and you want it to be just far enough away to where you don't get stopped out 
and not much further. Sometimes you might have a little support you could put it underneath. Sometimes you might have a little base or something. Let's say if you're trading a, um, a base breakout, okay? I mean, you certainly want to give it enough room, but then if you've got like a prior big old base in here, okay, not right here, but back here, you know that it really shouldn't come below this base. So you need to ask yourself, where will I be wrong? And how much room do I need it? Where, how much room do I need to give it? And where will I be obviously wrong? You trading something like a gatekeeper that sets up like this, then at the, if the stock goes on to make new highs, then you're wrong, okay? But just know that you need to give it enough room to avoid being stopped out on noise alone. Ever use a parabolic SAR as your stop years ago? Yes. Not so much in more recent times. A parabolic SAR is a geometric type of um, stop that's gonna that's gonna as the market climbs it's gonna climb up at a at a more sharp rate like that the problem with that is it's gonna do like this and then it's gonna knock you out and then the market's gonna take off without you so I go from this um, fairly tight in this case it was fairly loose swing trade stop and then I'm gonna let this stop stop I'm going to let this stop kind of widen out to where it becomes wider and wider so I can ride out those longer-term corrections. If you're using a parabolic SAR, it's going to be too quick to catch up to the price, and it's going to stop you out. Maybe if you're trying to take partial profits on something and it's going straight up, yeah, use a parabolic SAR. I just keep it easy. I let the stock so stop puh, slowly widen out with time. And that allows me to change my hat from my trading hat, and then I put on my trend following hat. Okay, I've got a pretty loose stop on this NG. It's up another 10% today. I might not bump my stop up 10% today. I might bump, bump my stop up 8%. So by doing so, I've allowed that stop to why now by an extra 2% today, provided it closes up 10% today, okay? So if I keep doing that, I'm going to get a wider and wider stop, and I get to a point where it's it's probably wide enough, okay? Within reason, I'll keep doing that. And sometimes I play little games. And on a higher price stock, if a higher price stock goes up a, a buck 11, well, then I'll raise my stop $1, and I'll call it keep the change. I won't raise it that 11 cents okay and then next day it goes up let's say a buck 22 you know and so now we got uh, I raise it another buck and then we have what we'll have like 33 cents so I'll let that stop slowly widen out in there and that's the secret of this whole system if there is a secret and as I've said time and time again I've showed this to some very intelligent people um, my buddy Emilio Tomasini over in Italy um, a guy, uh, well, I don't want to mention his name because I don't know if he wants to be uh, uh, called out, but a couple of very brainiac type of people have seen this, and they're like, I, I thought everybody would do this, but they don't. It's a shifting in the volatility to allow you to ride at the longer-term gains, and I've been told it's quite brilliant. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not bragging on this. I'm just excited that it works. I'm excited that I have some confirmation from some people who have been around for a long time long time and they think that that's a pretty cool way of doing things okay and, and if you if you're in this business long enough you get your pardon my French you get your ass handed to you enough to where there will be times where you doubt yourself trust me even though I've been in this business forever I still question myself I still doubt myself I, I still have a pulse and then getting this confirmation on some of these things is kind of nice it's like oh wait a minute okay it's pretty good so we are not intelligence. Well, the smarter we are, oh, you guys in here? The smarter you got, the smarter you are, um, the longer it's going to take, okay? Oh, uh, Sharon, is that for, um, I don't think the other people could see that. I don't know how we could do this. Uh, so let's say 10 goes to 100. How do you adjust the stop? Or the second loaf, or will you? Well, of course I'll adjust the stop. I'm not going to round trip a stock. I'm not going to round trip 50 points on a stock. Okay, so my stop is is here. 
at 40 something or whatever the case may be or let's just make it 40 round numbers my stops at 40 I'm not gonna let it run to 100 and then all the way back down to 40 no that's not what I'm saying what I am saying is let's see tans up two dollars and 13 cents today well I might bump my stop I don't know a buck and a half two bucks or maybe I'll play that keep the change game I'll go up two bucks on my stop I'll go from 40 to 42 okay and I'll also look at it too and say okay well if it's somewhere in this base it shouldn't come back to this base so maybe I'll keep it just in this base and then I'm not going to trail it on a one for one basis if it goes up two dollars and thirteen cents I'm not necessarily going to raise my stop two dollars and thirteen cents and often by doing nothing I let it widen out you guys need to go back in and read the second half of layman's it's all in there trust me okay so I might have to say that a few times just so people can go in. What is What was your comment about the crux of your system, something to do with volatility and expanding? Well, when you're changing hats from shorter term to longer term trader, you're allowing that stop to open up to ride out bigger picture gains, and you're also going from the shorter term volatility to the longer term volatility, however you want to look at it. As I've said before, um, and I've, I've given presentations where you do a probability cone, and not that I'm a huge fan of probability cones, but it does show uh, what's what's possible in the market. A probability cone, let's say you look back 100 days, it's well, it's going to give you a 100-day prediction, and that 100-day prediction is going to be either way up here or way down here. So that cone just gets bigger and bigger and bigger within reason and gets pretty huge. So in order to transition from this, short-term cone when the market can only go so far in a, a short period of time to a longer-term cone I let that stop widen out okay so this stop is this wide and then this stop over here is going to get wider and wider and wider as this moves more and more in my favor okay within reason okay I'm a spirally star because it smokes to be 12 years yeah if you read today's column and talked about 10 years from now when you're plotting that 15th oscillator you might actually realize uh, how many portfolio do you share? Okay, we uh, or we follow if we subs subscribe. I do right now. I'm just doing um, what I call the trading service, and that's that portfolio that I occasionally put. Well, lately it's been more than uh, occasionally put into this column, and that's just that's straight off of my website. Um, I, you know, I keep threatening to do an IPO service, and someday I might uh, follow through on that. But if you go right here on my website that's the trading service no oh, by the way I put the link I get I'm getting a lot of questions for I'm always saying is 10 years of archives I do have them up uh, and if you scroll down in here 10 years of archives are available right here and you can download these if you want to see the last 10 years I also have some YouTube videos that will help explain it too so subscribe to my YouTube channel okay um, but yeah, I might do an IPO service. I thought I've been thinking long and hard about. It. The problem is IPO has been on fire so much lately that um, I, I feel like I'm going to start it right at the peak of the market. Okay. Okay. So to answer to close the loop on Jonathan's question about if you are trailing a stop and stocks at 50 goes to 100. You would just slowly let it widen out, and I don't, you know, I'd have to see it, and have to see how long it took to get to 100. But it could easily be a fairly wide stop, maybe 80 dollars a share, and it's 100. You might give up as much as 20 percent of those of those gains. But as you've seen me do presentations before, you have to be willing to give up some of your open gains in order to capture and ride out those long-term corrections. If you're not willing to give up some of your 50 percent gains. You'll never make a hundred percent gain if you're not willing to give up some of your hundred percent gains. You'll never make two hundred percent. That's why we take that additional profit off the table, so we don't have to stress as much with that longer-term trend-following position. Okay. What's the best source for finding IPOs? I think I'm the best source for IPOs. Okay. Do you trade every day? What's your activity level like? No, not that much. Uh, download the service archives. I'm not much more active than my service is, okay, personally. Um, I might put in stops every day. I might put in orders every day, but I'm not necessarily trading every day. Um, there might be weeks or even a month 
where there's no activity whatsoever. It all depends on the market. Coming into this uh, market today, there are two potential trades that are uh, on the service. Okay. Okay, Sharon says, Excel 2013 is a built-in function to obtain stock quotes from Yahoo. It's not automatic. You have to tell it to recalculate, but it's there. Okay? And uh, Sharon, if you could email me that, um, I'll uh, make that available for whoever wants to use it. That's, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Watching the market. I have learned that I can't predict anything. However, these entry rules and dead money management rules keep me in the right trends and take me take the emotions out of the equation and that's Eric um, somebody earlier said uh, I think it was Otono said it's taken him 12 years to become successful Eric said he's he was talking to me recently he said he's been at it for a while and it's taken him a while to become successful too well it does take a while and for me it, it, it's like I have these epiphanies where it just gets a little more simpler with time and I've, I've peeled away all those crazy indicators over the years, and then I no longer try to outsmart it. Uh, early on, uh, especially when I first started putting out um, old public commentary 15 or more years ago, whenever it was, I used to try to time the market down to a day and then time everything, and then it was just, it was just grueling, and the pressure, was, uh, the pressure was really on to do that. And now it's like, well... Let's just see where it goes, and 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 goes up, it goes up, it goes down, it goes down. I got stops to take me out. I got trailing stops to try to ride the trend out. I'll take a partial profits just in case. Okay, you just you just get your rules, and you take your rules and you follow your rules, and it's easier said than done, but it's certainly possible. I get emails on a daily basis saying, "Okay, uh, let me tell you what I'm doing wrong," and I'm like. Okay, stop doing that. Why are you doing that? But 90% of the people won't plan their trade, and 99% of the people won't trade their plan. So take the pressure off of yourself. And this, I left this slide in from a couple weeks ago. I might leave it in forever. Don't try to predict every market, but do follow along with the market, with what the market is telling you, okay? And, again, plan your trade and trade to plan. And it's like you have all these questions. If you don't do this, then you're going to end up with all of this fluff in here, and you're going to make yourself absolutely nuts. So plan ahead of time. Follow your plan. Uh, most of my random thoughts, I think, are left over. Take things one day at a time. The other thing, let the market come to you. Right now, there's, a, there's not a whole lot of setups. I'm getting a lot of uh, questions about stocks lately. And it seems like almost on every one of them, pick it apart. And you people are probably thinking, well, geez, Dave, you know, you're like Mikey. You don't like anything. Why are you picking apart all these things? Well, because at this particular juncture, there's not a whole lot of setups, and especially the way the market itself played out. It had a sharp V-shaped type recovery. Okay, now it's making new highs again. You're not going to have any pullbacks setting up. And on the short side, you got too many days to the upside for the shorts to work out. So you're just not seeing a whole lot of setups. So what? Wait for your next opportunities. I mean, geez, look at what happened in the not-so-distance past. And this is uh, maybe I should throw out results not typical. I don't want everybody to think you could always do this, but this is pretty darn impressive. You know, go back and look at the uh, Landry list from the stock selection webinar, and those um, returns were phenomenal. But it's not always that good. Sometimes you have to sit back and wait for the market to come to you. So let the market come to you. Again, play a good offense in 2014. And this is my goal. And boy, I've been having a blast doing this so far. Knock on wood so far. Now wait till summer gets here. Let's see what happens. But if there's nothing to do, I'm not going to do anything. And that's going to be my plan of course course of action for the summer. Uh, but be super selective. If you can't stand it, then trade. If something looks so great, regardless of market conditions, then take it. Okay? But if it's mediocre, then let it go. And it's okay to do nothing, okay? A couple of announcements, um, and that's what I was kind of teasing about at earlier. You can see some of these stocks had some pretty incredible gains from the uh, stock selection webinar. Uh, some of them have since come back in, 
But as you can see, that certainly if something goes up 100%, you should be able to profit from uh, that. Uh, if you go to my website and click on Stock Selection Webinar, you get some more uh, information on that. And uh, the special offer is six months free to trading service if you sign up for the webinar. And trust me, a lot of the things that I, uh, Sharon and uh, Eric, who are here today, um, and Phil, y'all were all at the uh, webinar. Trust me, a lot of the things that I just keep reharping in these uh, weekly presentations, we went through all that in painstaking detail. And, uh, so uh, check them out. I'm very proud of the work. Again, you know, as I often say, you put work out there, you don't know how it's going to be received. Uh, I do have uh, volume two, and this is uh, of all of the last six months of 2003. I'm oh, sorry, 2013 are available of these shows that, like the show I'm doing now, I'm going to record that and save it off. Uh, again, my first two books are still relevant. Check them out. You can go to my website for more on that. Just go to Dave's, um, you go to the, the home page and click on uh, Dave's book. Join the YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. Uh, the spreadsheet that I'm showing is straight from the service. I show that spreadsheet every day. And then I show that, uh, obviously, when I show it in these weekly presentations, you're not seeing the new recommendations okay okay the question is do you have layman's on Kindle the answer is no and I answered that last week the reason is no is because uh, the Amazon model it's 995 uh, unless you want to sell a book for 995 uh, it's not going to go on Kindle and that's the publisher's choice on that but what I have been doing is if you buy layman's and I'll just it's just dishonor system you don't have to send me a receipt just say hey Dave I bought layman's um, can you give me a PDF and I'll be happy to make you a PDF. We talked about that last week. Okay, miss many moves by trying to time closely. Going for stock setups works better. Absolutely. Find a setup you like and go there. Lulu was the name of the dog in the Honeymoon's episode. Oh, okay. Lulu's a uh, character in a little, uh, little ditty rhyme. Lulu ran away. And the question becomes... Um, <laughs> What are we going to do now? Lulu's ran away. Lulu had a turtle, and I think she also had a duck. You guys know that? She put him in the bathtub to see. Well, I digress. All right, let's take a look at this market. And what I like to do is I like to look at the, um, the micro and work my way out to the macro. If you guys want to start talking about individual stocks, go ahead and uh, start Start asking about them now, and we'll get to them as soon as I get through the market real quick. Um, if you don't mind, put uh, one stock on each line because um, uh, just put the stock name in and then hit carriage return and put your next stop in. Because if you put two or more in a line, I'm, I might get to only one of those, and, and you'll miss out on the re remainder. Because I, del I do delete your question as soon as I answer it. All right, let's take a look at the P's, and then let's work our way out. Uh, on a micro level, we did have that little pause day yesterday. If you read the column this morning or if you were on my service from last night, you'll know that I talked about a pause day. Sometimes you get a big, big up day in the markets or even a down day. And then you have a bit of a pause day, and then you have another big up day. So it's possible that we could have a big up day today. I don't know. I, I'm not going to predict it. I'm just a trend follower. So if it keeps going up, then uh, I'm going to keep following it up. But I'm not going to argue with a market that's at brand new highs. Okay, right now the P's are at all time highs. My only concern, as I've been saying at nauseam, is that we went straight up in here in a V-shaped type of manner. Now, on a micro level, one thing that's kind of cool is that the whole world sold off a couple of days ago on the Russian fiasco, I guess Ukraine or whatever. And then you'll notice that we did recover to close off the worst levels. Okay, so all. So the world didn't come unglued, and then, of course, we've taken off so far from there. So, so far, so good. Market's still kind of overbought in here, but you know me. I'd like to see it get super-duper overbought. I did have some corrections. I'd like to see it clear this 1850 decisively before it starts correcting. But you know the routine, one day at a time. All right, NASQAQ. Uh, well, what's the long term on the piece? Well, I suppose longer term... We're still in a longer-term uptrend, and as ominous as this looked right here, and we got some shorts that set up doing this slide, and the only one we have left is GME from that slide, okay? Um, 
as bad as it looked, we had the bow tie down of all-time highs on a daily chart, not a weekly, but a daily. That's still a pretty serious signal. Uh, the market turned around, went straight back up. So, so far, it's just a massive correction. I wouldn't even use massive, but a fairly sizable correction in longer-term trends. Somebody says, hey, Dave, seems like over the last couple of years, every single rollover turned into just be a correction. Okay? And I'm like, you're right. And the conspiracy theorists will tell you that that's because the Fed has come in and bought with both fists. Those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago know that I messed up the pronunciation of the word fist. But the uh, Fed has been buying with both fists every time the market sells off. Can they do it forever? Can they support it forever? I don't know. I don't know. My buddy Rob Hanna says that his calculations show that every time they come in, it's had a diminishing return. It's kind of like a drug. The Fed's money has been a drug. It used to be a little bit of money got the market moving, and now it's taking more and more money to, be, to keep the market moving. So who knows? Okay. Uh, but, yeah, every correction we've had over the past couple of years has been met with buying by the Fed. So buying those, buying those corrections that look like the market is just getting ready to roll over and die will work until they don't. Okay. At some point it won't. Uh, but hey, as long as it goes up, who cares? Uh, NASDAQ in here, not a bad little um, little move higher into multi-year highs. So, so far, so good there. Let's take a look at the Rusty real quick. Uh, Rusty is just off of all-time, well, right there. Okay, if it closes here, we're going to be at all-time highs. i like to see it take out the top of uh, this range, this big range we had a couple days ago. Maybe it, too, is going to be the big up day pause and then another big up day. But, hey, Rusty was up. I mean, geez, it needs some time to consolidate its gains. It was up 2.5% a couple days ago. So that's a pretty serious breakout in the Russell 2000. And if we close anywhere around 120 basis the IWM, then we would be at all-time highs. Take a look at these EFA shares. And you can see that they, they were dying in here. They just absolutely imploding a few days ago. And then now, bam, winning up here at multi-year highs, not quite all-time highs. So EFA shares, or uh, easiest way to explain these, it's everything that's outside of the United States. I wonder, is A Africa? Is it Europe, Far East, and Africa? I'm not sure. Uh, but it's it's everything outside of North America for the most part. Okay, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at gold, a commodity. Um, a few weeks back, as you know, I was bullish on gold. We played ANV, we played NG. I uh, recommended a few other ones on my ancillary uh, Landry lists, and uh, some of them actually worked out pretty darn good. Uh, the gold stocks have been outperforming gold on a dramatic basis. On the way down, they were underperforming gold. Uh, they were going down a lot more than gold was. But on the way back up, they were really coming back up uh, with a vengeance. But now gold's kind of caught up in here. And as you can see, uh, just shy of these multi-month highs. Let's throw some bow ties in. You can see we had a pretty nice bow tie in here off of multi-year lows. So I still think a good bottom is in place in gold. And I especially think that a bottom is in place in the gold stocks okay now let's take a look at the gold stocks and this is one thing I want to talk about today is the micro versus the macro just like we looked at that A and V doesn't look so good on a short term basis kind of sideways at best but if you back the chart out a little bit the macro looks pretty good I mean pretty good for gold you got to give these commodities a bit of a pass when you're looking for perfection these commodity related stocks because they can chop around a little bit more now if this is a biotech stock or something else, then you could look for a little bit more perfection in it. But for the most part, you've got a bow tie off of this major double bottom. So to me, this looks like the mother of all bottoms is in place here. Did you say fist? What did you say, Dave? Now I'm laughing again. Richard, you're not going to suck me into saying the wrong thing again. <laughs> we have ladies in the room. <laughs> Of course, you ladies laugh more than the guys whenever I screw up, so that's fine. Uh, silver, same sort of action there, too. Silver was kind of interesting because silver was lagging 
And then all of a sudden, silver really took off. Silver is going to be a lot more bumpier than gold. You think gold's crazy? Silver's even more crazy in here. Um, I think last week we were talking about this. It's possible that someday, and maybe we'll live long enough to see it. Someday, silver may actually cost more than gold because silver is being used up. Gold is being hoarded and silver is being used up. Okay, write that down. Um, what else is going on? Uh, sector actions. A lot of sectors have come back with a vengeance. Uh, Retail is one of them, and banks are another one. Banks, you see this bow tie down? Well, they just turn around and went right back up. They're not too far from new highs. This is especially true with some of these regional areas. They've made it all the way back to new highs. Let's take a look at retail before I forget. And you can see it made this huge V-shaped recovery in here. It looked like it was left for dead, and then turn around and went right back up to make new highs. I wouldn't rush out and buy these areas because they're oversold in their V-shaped recoveries, but it is kind of interesting that some of these weaker areas have made it all the way back to their old highs. Real estate's been doing pretty good lately. Um, it's not at all-time highs, though, but you can see it's been working its way higher. It's at multi-year highs in here. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of real estate. The stocks don't move around that much. Drugs have been doing really well in here uh, today, notwithstanding, but you can see not too far from uh, new highs in there. Biotech's been doing pretty good in here, although it's losing a little bit of steam in this um, rally out of a pullback. And that's, I'm a little bit nervous about some of these biotech stocks. I think we talked about them last week, or certainly on a stock-by-stock -stock basis. If I'm being asked about a biotech that's already going up about seven or 800 percent, it's like one has to wonder if it's possibly priced for perfection. Health service is doing pretty good in here. You see banging out new highs in here. In spite of all the news, in spite of all the doom and gloom, right? This is why I don't get caught up in the doom and gloom, okay? Because what is, is. So the health stocks is going up, as you can see in here. Defense just off of uh, new highs. Again, the home builders, as I've said a little while ago, but doing okay in here as of late. Leisure banging out new highs. So I don't bore you to go through too many of these, but for the most part, as you can see, things are looking pretty good in here. Um, it's never a safe environment to buy into, but I certainly wouldn't say it's safe to, to jump in with both fists at this moment, but take things on a setup-by-setup -setup basis. If you like something, if you see a little newspaper company looks pretty good, then, hey, pick up a newspaper. Pick it up, right? Pick it up and then uh, toss it out when it hits that initial profit target, bump the stop higher, and then hopefully ride out a longer-term trend. So in a nutshell, things are looking pretty good in here. One more thing I want to point out. I've been a Super Bowl on uranium for quite a while, and it's been doing pretty good in here. We're long URZ, URZ, and you can see that uh, trigger back here somewhere turned into some dead money, as you can see, for a little while, but then now, bam, off to the races. Uh, for those of you who are in this one, don't split hairs. If it gets really close to that initial profit target, feel free to take profits. All right, I think that's enough for now. Let me just show you a couple of the areas, Internet and um, the semis at these new highs in here. So anything technology related, as you would expect, with the NASDAQ at new highs is doing pretty well. All right, SLCA, SLCA for Mr. Craig. Okay. Well, there's no setup here, so this would have to break out to new highs and then pull back. My problem with it, if it did, you'd have that V-shape action going on. If you take a look within the metals, there are still some golds and silvers that are just on the cusp of beginning to take off. Uh, Craig, you're on a service, so take a look at that that speculative one I talked about last night. That one might work. Okay, is sale a TKO for Mr. Wynn? I think it is, um, sort of, okay? Uh, yeah, it's sort of a TKO. It sort of has like a double top knockout look to it. Um, my only concern here is it's just going straight up over a short period of time. But it has been, I have been watching this one, and it has been in the retail list in here, okay? Uh, I think I would pass. It's just kind of funky looking. Uh, it broke out above these highs, and then it came all the way back in to these prior highs in here. I'd probably leave it alone just for that. If it's in, if it's in your momentum list or if you're already long, stay long. GRT on a pullback for Mr. Jeff. Uh, no. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of at these mid-levels. Um, we just look at these REITs. These REITs are at a little, well, 
I see what you're saying. If you zoom in on the REITs, they look pretty good. Uh, I prefer the stocks that if you look at a play a transitional type of pattern, I prefer the stocks that are at much lower levels, like down here somewhere, as opposed to these mid-level stocks. I think you can find something better than the REITs. Hey, Doc, uh, J A J probably not going to like it. Okay. Uh, and the reason I knew I probably wouldn't like it, it's a big, thick stock. And look at your volatility. It's volatility at 15. The overall market's about 11 right now. And it's just a bit of an electric cardiogram. It's just kind of going sideways. And it's at 92 now. It was at 92 last July. It's hard to make any money in that. I'd much rather be in a little uranium company, okay, that, that just makes a move like this. What's a move? What's that move? That's a, let's take a look at that real quick. That's a 30% move over a short period of time. 30% move in J&J &J might take about 10 years, okay? So I'd leave that one alone. AVL for Phil. How's the weather over there? Yeah, that looks okay. It's bottoming out. Um, it does have some bad memories, but I guess at these prices, it, it's okay. Just keep an eye on your overhead supply and resistance. It's probably a bow tie. Yeah, it's a bow tie. It's real... Uh, it's not thin, but it's a penny stock, so be careful. Maybe on a little bit more, of a, just a tiny bit more of a pullback. But realize you're going to have some um, overhead supply to deal with. Meat for Jonathan. Um, yeah, this one's shaping up. It's kind of bottomed out here. It's shaping up. I think on a pullback, I'd give it a maybe. Okay. THM for Phil. Uh, yeah, it's another little gold stock. Major bottom in place. Um, I don't like this one or two big bars in here. It's, it is a little penny stock, so be careful with that. But but I hear you. I mean, some of these penny stocks are worth going after at this juncture in gold. Uh, what I've been telling people to do for the most part is to take a look at the GDXJ. And that way you can participate in some of those lower tier gold companies. But if you are willing to take the risk, some of those uh, goals look pretty good. Mr. D wants to know about BAA. Uh, it's too flat, okay? Go, you know, take a look at gold overall. You know, here's a stock that's just flat and it's got a wide loose trading back behind it, okay? Seed on a pullback. Forgot who asked. Uh, probably not because it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. It's got some overhead way up here. I guess that's that's a good problem to have. But it's kind of it, it was off through the races, came right back in. It's just too crazy. And look at your HV 150. I mean, it it could be it could have bottomed down. It might be headed higher, but it's just not worth the uh, risk. Man H for Mr. John with an H. Uh, maybe on a pullback, but you got a nice little persistent trend in here, a uh, decent longer-term trend. Um, is it priced for perfection, I guess, would be the next question. Yeah. The only problem is, is it priced for perfection, meaning that it's been in such a longer-term uptrend, it's already up, oh, I don't know, four or 500%. Has it ran its course? I don't know. But maybe find something that's in a less mature as some people say trend UIS for Lewis um, it's a little too all over the place for my taste I mean it would have to break out decisively and, and then pull back it's also well it's not as thick as it used to be it used to be a big thick stock um, but it might be one of these box stocks where it makes a box, jumps to a new level, makes a box. I don't trade box stocks, but I, but sometimes my setups will get us into stocks that will make a box, make a box on top of box, et cetera, like RLYP comes to mind. It's been doing that lately. Okay. Well, it's pullback. Okay, pullback for us, pullback for us, and now it's making a box. Maybe it'll make a box on top of the box. ZBB in a pullback, absolutely. Zebra Technologies. Andrea, I think, asked about that one. Let 
Okay. Oh, Zebra Energy. It used to be Zebra Technologies. I guess I guess Zebra Technologies went out of business. ZBB. Uh, maybe I'll take it to something else. Uh, my problem here is this is what I call a bottle rocket. It shot straight up. It went up 175% overnight. Uh, it's too dangerous to trade now. Look at the HV2, 150. CECO for art. The only thing I'm not going to like about it is it's an educational company. And these educational companies, if I can get it to come up. What I've found with these guys is they could be real choppy and hard to trade. And they trade these chunks. It's like, it's like, oh, it's headed down. And then it gaps down. Then it goes all the way back up. And then it implodes over a few days. And then it starts crawling higher. And then it implodes. And they're just kind of all over the place. So I'm just not a big fan of educational stocks. Not that I would never trade them. We just spent 20 minutes earlier saying you should trade anything as long as it's set up and looks good. But in this particular case, um, it's just kind of wide and loose. I wouldn't get that excited about it. And then they're kind of all over the place longer term. I think you could probably find something uh, a little bit cleaner out there. SQM. Uh, let's say Chile Chemical Company. Be interested to see what they do. I don't like the big gap down back here, but it looks like it's since closed that. It's kind of getting a little crazy. I don't see a setup. Maybe on a setup. It does look like it's bottomed out. Looks a little bit crazy. Nor for when? Yeah, on a pullback, sure. Why not? The only problem is, and this happens a lot now, aluminum and some of these other metals, is you've got a lot of overhead supply, even though you're going back a year or two. I, I think I'd leave it alone just based on that. Okay. So Scott says GH stat retreating back up with heavy volume. I hope you like it. I pulled the trigger on it this morning. P.S. Thank you for saving me 10 years. You're welcome, Scott. What a nice thing to say. G.S.A.T. I'm going to be kind to him on this one, right? G.S.A.T. G.S.A.T. Well, I, it's not coming up much. chart. G.T.A.T. maybe? There it is. G.T.A.T. I'm guessing you bought that. I don't know if it's G.T.A.T. or not. Uh, problem with this one is it's just kind of parabolic. Let me know if it was GTAT you meant to say. Because GSAT's not coming up on my screen. Uh, this thing is just going straight up. It's just kind of melted up in here. I think it would be too dangerous to trade. Okay. By definition, stocks that have bottomed will have a lot of overhead resistance. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Is it your point that more point that more bases formed above the bottom? Well, not necessarily. They won't always have they won't always have have overhead um, resistance. Let me see if I can get a white screen. Okay. But yeah, that is one problem when you're trading a low-level base because sometimes a stock will sometimes a stock will drop, it'll base, it'll drop, it'll base, it'll drop, it'll base, and then you're trying to trade it here, and then you got bases upon bases to deal with. But the pattern I like the most is this, and it goes sideways and sideways and sideways, for years and years and years and years and years. Okay. And then it begins to take off. That's what I call a phoenix, okay? SPWR did that. A lot of these goals we're going after have done that. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, okay. Uh, Scott, I can't pull it up on the screen. GSAT was not on the um, on the bulletin board, but I guess it is now. Yeah, I don't. I, I can't give you an opinion on it. RNF, double bottom bow tie. At all time low for Mr. Phil with a smiley face. Well, if Phil says it's good, it must be good. Or an F. Hmm. This is an ag chemical. Maybe all those chemicals did wash away. Well, you got some bad memories around 25, so eh, that might be a good problem to have. It's a little bit on the thin side. Not crazy thin, but 
I think I would pass based on the bad memories. And you're like, you know, some people are like, hey, that's 25%. Well, I don't know. I think I'll pass. I'd pass based on that. I hear you, though. If this base was more elongated and this was further back, then maybe. How about URG? URG is going to need to pull back, okay? That's a uranium stock. Sure, next pullback. That, would, that, that could certainly work. Okay, I'm bullish on uranium. I'm, I'm bullish on uranium, but yeah, on pullbacks, URG looks pretty good. Uh, hopefully, our URZ will bang out that profit target for us, so we could uh, hang on to it for a long time. A good eye, Ken. SCCO long, low HV. Buy more shares. SCCO. Mm, it's not. Bad. Um, I don't like the way it pulled all the way back to this base in here. It is a copper stock, and these metals can be a little squirrely. I, it's okay. I, I don't know if I would, I would load the boat or anything on that. Okay, Carol wants to know about Tesla. And uh, maybe on a pullback. Problem with Tesla now is it's it's uh, it's priced for perfect perfection. One has to wonder how much further can it go. Alvin wants to know about I think that's Hill. Can't read. It's not all in caps. Is it Hill? H I L L. All right. Yeah, I don't like the gap down. And then I also don't like the fact that it's going sideways for well over a month or a month and a half in here. So I'd pass on that one. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> He's sounding like, uh, what's the name? Greg wants to know about UGA. Okay. United States Gasoline Fund. Well, it's just wide and loose and sideways. Draw your lines, draw your arrows. Um, I would leave that alone because it's all over the place. Okay. WX for Mr. James. Uh, no. It broke out. It came all the way back in. So just... Uh, I mean, it could actually break down. It could set up as a short. James also wants to know about CPHD. CPHD. Uh, well, it barely got past this last little peak in here. So it would have to accelerate higher and then pull back for me to get excited about it. Also, at pretty high levels longer term in here. Um, now, if the market keeps plowing ahead, then we're all we're left with. It's, it's these stocks at high levels. Thoughts about Zoo? Zoo? No, the jump is too it's, the jump is too crazy on this one. It went from forty bucks a share to eighty bucks a share in a couple of days. That's just too crazy. It has a bit of a bottle rocket characteristic. A lot of times they go straight up and then come straight back down. So very dangerous to trade that. Andrea B I O F. Andrea B I O F. Uh, no, it's just kind of squirrely. It's squirrely, and it's 161 on the H V, and this kind of looks like a mound of overhead resistance. So I'd leave that one alone. Don is here, and Dodd would like to know about F. Uh, I think it's still in trouble. It's got a lot of overhead supply, everything we talked about last couple of weeks. But it's crawling back up to resistance. I'd leave it alone. It's nothing to really. Where where is it now? Sixteen. Where was it a year ago? Sixteen. A G E N. And no, it's going kind of just too straight up. It's going up a hundred percent over a couple of days. That's a little too crazy. And then you got bad memories, and it's kind of all over the place. I think you could find a little bit better there if you look hard enough. When Bolt, B A L T. Yeah, these shipping stocks can be pretty choppy, but uh, on a pullback, I might have to consider that one. I, I hear you. 
FVE. FVE. Uh, no, too wide and loose and sideways. Electrocardiogram award on that one live. We're going to go into a uh, bit of a lightning round here. Uh, you no, know, it just shot straight up. It went up uh, a thousand percent, and then it's starting to come back in. I think it's just too dangerous now. It's too crazy. PEIX, I think it's going to be a crazy one, too. PEIX, that's uh, that ethanol company. Yeah, I mean, it's gone up from 40. It's already up 500, 600, 1,000 uh, percent. But when you look at it longer term, you can see where it does have some potential to it. Maybe on some pullbacks, but boy, that's going to be dangerous. Look at your HV 135. So be careful on that one. SQM like pot. You like pot? Okay, good for you. You should move to Colorado. SQM like. Oh, you mean it's like pot? Okay, it's a fertilizer. Gotcha. I thought you were just telling me you like pot. VVUS for Don. Uh, no. I'm going to teach John, Don how to draw arrows on his charts. My as a long trade. Uh, yeah, it's just too, it's just too abrupt of a change. Too much of a, a straight shot up. Dangerous to trade. James wants to know about S, Q, and X. S. John, you're next. Um... Maybe on a pullback. It's got to keep headed higher. John wants to know about INO. It's going to be a biotech. It's just kind of all over the place. And it's just barely cleared its prior little peak and it came right back to it. So I would pass on that. Maybe if it could continue higher and then look to play pullbacks along the way. John wants another John with an H wants to know about NWBO NWBO. Uh, no, I don't like the way it just kind of barely got past the second peak. It came right back in. In here, lock for James. Okay, uh, this looks like a possible short in the works here. You can see it's been pretty in a pretty serious slide. I don't see any reason to go out and short the market. Just yet, but this stock looks like it could be at the end of its run. RNF. Yeah, we talked about that one. It's got some overhead resistance to it. I think Zoo, we got to uh, Gummo. Uh, maybe on a pullback, but that's uh, that's on my momentum list. But yeah, on a pullback, sure, absolutely. CRMD is a long. Uh, no, just barely got past the prior little peak in here. Okay, also a little on the thin side. DROQ is a short. Or Q. Drill quip. No, because it's it was headed lower, but then it had this big wide range bar. It pushed well into the, all this stuff here. It's just all over the place. I'd leave it alone. CDTI, Andrea, uh, no, it's just kind of bumping up. It had to break out the new highs and then maybe on a pullback. CCL short if the market fails. It's going to be a uh, cruise line. Ah, maybe. I mean, it certainly looks like it's ran out of steam, but it's not coming off of all-time highs, and then you're just going to, it could fall into this fluff back here. So I wouldn't, you know, I would rather go after something on the short side that's at high levels and just beginning to roll over. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. WDAY, we have to wrap it up in just one second. Um, yeah, this looks pretty good. Maybe in a little bit more of a pullback. It needs a little bit more pullback in here, but that certainly looks pretty good. I uh, almost went in on that one because it looks pretty good. Hecla, HL. Uh, Hecla's kind of all over the place. It's another one of those stocks that looks like a major bottom, but it's just kind of all over the place. I think you can find it a little bit better in the silver stocks out there. I can't get – well, you're on the service. Look at the service, today's list. There's a couple in there. Uh, and finally, ARIA. No, big gap down. Who asked for that? Don, is that you? 
<laughs> well, look, uh, we're out of time. It gets hard to manage the uh, recordings right around now, so let me go ahead and uh, wrap things up. I, I have a blast in these shows, as you can tell, so thanks for showing up. Without you, there is no show. I'm humbled by your presence. Anything you need to know that's not answered, shoot me an email, Dave at Dave Landry dot com everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again and then i hope to see all you guys and girls next thursday thank you so much